Okie dokie. Ready to keep it moving? Some awesome talks, a couple more, and hopefully a live demonstration at the very ends. That should be pretty fun. Okay, uh, this is the Monica Belushi fan club uh, from Jason Killam from Red Canary. Red Canary in the house. Woo! And uh, let's, let's, let's hear it. Take it away. Hi, so my name is Jason Killam. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Monica Bellucci fan club. It's really cool, but uh, it's actually about the detection defense lessons I learned, at least, and I think a lot of people could learn from looking through the TrickBot forum data, and we'll get to why it's called this here in a second. So uh, I work at Red Canary. I, do make, I make detection rules at Red Canary. I'm a detection engineer, so uh, as, as they say, we eat our own dog food, so I write the rules, and then I work the queue, and I deal with the bad rules and the good rules and whatever. So um, I've seen, we see we have some customers that different, so we onboard customers in different stages. Sometimes they are our customers, meaning they're in the middle of a dumpster fire, and some customers think there's something about to happen, so there's maybe a little bit of a dumpster fire happening. Or maybe the dumpster fire is smoldering and they've kind of put it out, but there's, there's still some stuff going on in their environment and they have to have somebody monitor it. So that's what we do sometimes. Or it's just regular customers with, that want to have good security monitoring. So I'm also an Air Force cyber operator. At, as people say, it's a, I'm a 1B4. Uh, I'm an I'm a elite 1B4 cyber guy. And uh, I actually went to the Air uh, I'm actually... Uh, my unit is here kind of local on Scott Air Force Base, and our unit went to Italy for an op. I came back with only four bottles of wine. There were some people in my group that came back with 24 bottles of wine in their, in their suitcases, which apparently there's no limit, and I kind of regret I didn't come back with that many. Um, Should have got more. Uh, yeah, and like I said, I'm like a moth to a dumpster fire in that, like, all these, when these companies have these things happen, I kind of lurk and dig through the data in our Splunk instance, and I like to kind of understand everything these guys did, because I want to know if we missed something, or if there's something we could detect better, or to stop them faster, or if there was nothing we could have done because it was already game over with these kind of people. So uh, an overview for this. So to me, any, if regardless of where you, what you do in InfoSec, I think people could pull something cool from the data I'm going to show you, and you can look for it through it yourself, and I'll show you how to do that here. Um, so if you're a red teamer, this is kind of literally a red team manual for them, so there's a lot of stuff there that you can do. Um, a pen, uh, or a SOC analyst, these are all things you should be looking for. If you're a CISO, there's a lot of security policy kind of stuff in here, sort of to me, that I could kind of see. And also, the other question is, like, this Conti TrickBot, these guys have disbanded, so they're gone, right? Like, they're not going to ever come back, so why would I even bother looking at this or talking about this? Well, these guys are gone, but most of them either they rebrand under a different name and it's exactly the same thing, or they just scatter to different groups and they take their techniques with them and rinse and repeat. So the situation in February... People are living under a rock. You, you, you Russia invaded Ukraine, and the TrickBot Conti group actually pledged allegiance to Russia and said anybody that t attacks Ukraine is going to get attacked by us. This guy, uh, Conti Leaks, we don't know his actual name, um, but he's like, P -p okay. <laughs> and he, I guess he was in the middle of there, he somehow in infiltrated the group a little bit, and he dumped everything online. And uh, I didn't know who he was at first, and then actually, uh, I started, like, his last post is about how he did an interview with CNN, and the FBI, I guess, messaged him and said, hey, could you stop dumping all this data online? He's like, okay, fine, I guess, I'll, I'll stop. But, uh, yeah, he has, he has, he's pretty, 
interesting. And he basically says, glory to Ukraine. I'm going to go fight in the front lines and dumps all this stuff online. So um, I want to talk if people keep up with this stuff. When it came out, uh, Krebs on security uh, kind of talked about the chat logs and some other stuff and about the interpersonal relationships and how they like work together, who manages who, the names of these people. That stuff's cool, but like not interesting to me. Uh, there was actually a whole section, section, uh, set of files for the forum leak for that, that one I've got in the little red box. That's the part that was interesting to me because that's the handbook. That's like their uh, operator's manual, so that's cool to me. So it had lots of tools, walkthroughs, command lines, guides for privilege escalation, how to delete backups, a whole bunch of stuff. So, But it's in Russian, and I don't read Russian. I'm, yeah, yet, no, that's all I know. <laughs> and it's a, split across a bunch of text files. So like, I might have opened every single text file and looked through these. There's like, uh, I don't remember how many, like 100 or so text files are split across different web pages of this guide, this forum. So, enter Google Translate, and this guy on the on GitHub called the Parmac. Uh, that's the link there at the bottom. This is kind of where I started with this data because I saw it was on it was Google translated, and I was like, oh, cool! I could just open this data and start looking through it. So, and then I piped them all to text files. And I mean, if you're doing this, uh, don't forget to put it in a different folder other than the folder you're sending it to, because uh, if you know how a loop works. It like finds all the text files and then finds a new text file and starts appending the stuff from that text file and then yeah you end up with an eight gig text file which doesn't go well. <laughs> so Monica Bellucci is apparently the title of the forum says the Monica Bellucci fan club and it's in there. I, uh, I did a word count 148 times and I'm guessing that's for every time the ti the title of the page and the the breadcrumbs to the page are at the bottom. So I had to delete it out of there a bunch of times and it was very annoying. And I just thought it was funny that they're like literally hosting a, a guidebook uh, for this, for their, their hacking stuff on a forum f named, oh, it was named for, the for, for this freaking Italian actress, which I thought was pretty funny. So yeah, I think it was how they just, the guy, whoever stole the data was just on the site, copied the data, control A the whole page and dumped everything he could. So the tools that they use is, generally speaking, from, from theirs, they use a lot of lull bins, which for people aren't aware is tools that are already on Windows by default. So Net, uh, NLTest, and PowerShell are the big ones, obviously, that I, I specifically saw mentioned. Um, some traditional red team tools that you'll see, you see a lot these days, Cobalt Strike, Rubius, Seatbelt, and Chrome. Uh, and then some abused sysadmin tools uh, that I don't see much from red teams, I think because these tools are kind of more how they accomplish some goals that a red team wouldn't typically need to do. But R clone for exfilling data, ngrok, and AD fine for enumerating the network. Uh, and then some remote access tools, they use AnyDesk mostly was mentioned in there, but like I've Splashtop, Atera, um, I think I've seen a new one is um, Synchro or something like that. Like they just rotate through them. They, if you If you blacklist one, then they'll just start using another. So AnyDesk is the one I mentioned specifically, but there's a lot more. So some of the specific stuff for lull bins they use is net commands. So if you if you want to find the domain admins for the network, you do net users domain admins, and you get the list of domain admins for the domain. So they'll run that a lot to find a domain admin, because that's what, the first thing they want is domain admin privileges, just like any pet tester wants. So, and the other thing they want is they want to find where the domain controller is. So they'll use the tool, they'll use NL test to do run DC list and they'll find the, the, the domain controller and how to get to it and log on to it and do whatever they want. Uh, another one I see sometimes is the domain trusts, all trusts and trusted domains. I see those sometimes with like Qbot, which is another, which is, would be like the precursor to this. So you have to imagine that this is like the bad guy has the, a bot on the network already, like Qbot is, a, is one, TrickBot was a, the older one, um, whatever it is, Ice ID or something like that. So one of the first tools that they mentioned, and it has like the whole entire script for this, is called Subdrill. Uh, it's, it's probably something that red teamers here are probably familiar with. I'm not as familiar with it, but like it's basically a script to enumerate all the OSINT 
about subdomains that they have available to them. So they, it'll basically take a domain and it'll spit out all the subdomains for that domain and you can drill into their subdomains, that's hence the name. So it looks through like URL scan, um, I think the Wayback Machine, and some other stuff like that. And Cobalt Strike, which is probably not a surprise to anybody here, uh, or at least anybody that's into this kind of stuff like me. Uh, it's kind of pretty infamous for this. It's like pretty much any, any kind of malware dropper you see out there these days. If you follow Brad Duncan on uh, Twitter or malware traffic, it's everything leads to Cobalt Strike pretty much. Well, that's sort of changing now, but I mean, at this time, pretty much everything was Cobalt Strike. And most of the documentation in their stuff was like how to set up a server. Uh, they have like their, their settings for their server uh, is like a Ubuntu server uh, with like this, mu this much RAM um, and this much storage and that kind of stuff and the processor, I don't remember what it was, but like, and then it just has a whole bunch of scripts on how to set it up and how to basically get it started. So the next, so one of the things they do with Cobalt Strike is they use some tool, a tool called C2 Concealer, which is a tool from 40 North and I think you'll kind of start to see a theme here. Everything's just pulled from some other, some other GitHub, some other source. So like they, they've, they're just really good red teamers that you know don't provide a report at the end. But uh, they're, from personal experience of seeing Cobalt Strike, uh, they can do these things to make their Cobalt Strike really stealthy and do all sorts of stuff to make it blend in with like normal traffic. But a lot of the times they don't. Like for instance, the default for Cobalt Strike is to spawn to run DLL 32 without a command line. And if you've ever looked at run DLL 32, it usually has a command line for something to run a DLL, as it kind of sounds like. So you'll usually see a command line with it. So it's kind of weird if you see it without one and making network connections, because that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so here's some other examples. Uh, this is a, no, a tw cool Twitter account. It's called Cobalt Strike Bot, and it's just some, I, th I don't know who runs it, but like, they just find Cobalt Strike beacons on probably virus total, and then they post the spawn two values, which are the command lines that these actually are. So like in this case, run DLL32 is the top one that they use the most. DLL host is another common one, all those. So uh, we have a pretty good blog uh, at Red Canary about how to detect Cobalt Strike. There's stuff like name pipes, the run DLL32 thing, a whole bunch of stuff. You can just look for kind of the default behavior for Cobalt Strike, and even if they remove one default behavior, sometimes they forget another. So it's good to try to look for those things because it's probably gonna result in some good stuff. Another tool they use is Tor. So pe most people think when they think Tor, they're just thinking of it as traffic. I wanna anonymize my traffic going out. These guys generally use it to anonymize their traffic coming in. So they'll, they had kind of a lengthy guide in, of text on you set up the Tor client and then you get your you basically set up a, a, an onion web server address to, to remote back in, but instead of hosting a web server, they're hosting SSH RDP to remote into the server, to, to remote into that workstation or server they need to get onto. So, yeah. And they'll, they'll usually set these with like NetSH rules or uh, PowerShell rule to just for allow the traffic in. <coughs> so here's an example. Uh, in this case, yeah, that's not Google updates.exe, as pe people could probably guess. This is actually tor.exe. Uh, if you look up the hash for it, it's funny, I, I should have probably included a screenshot of this, but on VirusTotal, tor itself has zero out of whatever on, on VirusTotal. So it's not gonna come up as malicious in your, in your logs. So it's kind of interesting from that perspective. <clears throat> and the other options there, those allow it to run as a service, as a, like a system thing. That's kind of actually one, one reason why it's running out of the Windows folder and not like a user folder. Um, and then the tech F option with that text file, that's the Tor like config. So that has like, trust these nodes, don't do this thing, do, do, do that. So um, if you kind of look for those things, you can usually find Tor for the, uh, those options. Um, also a thing that helped me a lot was I found like the online guide command line guide for Tor from like Debian or something like that, and it kind of gave some other command lines that are pro probable. And also, there's also some files that we'll get to yeah, here. So also when Tor runs, it actually creates a couple files that are related to like it's, it's running. There's the state lock file and this cached micro desk consensus. These are all kind of files that they need for operation. 
And when it's running a system, it's not going to be in a user folder. It'll be under like, um, it's still under app data roaming, but there's like a service profiles folder that'll run in. Uh, but it's, if it's under running, if it's running under a user context, it'll run under um, that app data roaming folder. Which people, if people have ever worked on a Windows system, um, you have your username, documents, and stuff like that. Instead of going to documents, you go to app data, and that's where all this stuff is residing. So you look for these files popping up on a box, and the, the binary is not named Tor. That's really bad. Or it's, I think it's the Brave browser, and some other stuff uses it, but like. There's a pretty small set of actual legitimate things. But again, if somebody's running Tor on your network, that's probably a concern anyways. So, <laughs> uh, And then another tool, so what they'll do with Tor and, and Grok, which is another one I'll get to in a second, is they'll basically use it to set up a backdoor. So the script that they have basically downloads Tor from the Tor project and then copies it into Windows temp and renames it to Sysmon. So again. If you're, run, if you're running Sysmon, probably from the Windows root folder, like most people do when it installs, uh, if you find Sysmon running from somewhere else, that's probably pretty weird. And then, they'll de and then they use the, de the not sucking service manager, which is NSSM. This is kind of a tool to um, uh, manage services and create services on a system. So they kind of use it as a way to create a service without doing the service command line, which I don't know why they didn't bother doing that, because it's probably not that bad. But anyways. <laughs> um, then they'll install SSH, so they'll basically enable, enable an SSH server on that Windows computer, and then they'll start both the NGROC process, or sorry, the Tor process and the SSH service and make those new services. And then they'll create a firewall rule to allow those in. So, so the NGROC is the other tool we're gonna, we're gonna talk about with, it's just they use it exactly like they use Tor, and sometimes they'll just use one over the other. Uh, depending on you know if somebody's looking for Tor traffic or something like that, they might switch to Ngrok. So Ngrok is actually kind of easier to te detect, which I thought thought was interesting. Is like the domains it always connects to Ngrok.io or Ngrok.com, and we'll have some screenshots because it's really easy to use. Anybody can use this. You can just go to Ngrok site and create a free account and make it and set up a, a, a it gives you all the stuff to create a tunnel. So it's generally used if you want to make host a web server. That's what kind of like lazy sysadmins do when they want to make a web server. They just start it on their box and they create an ngrok tunnel and then they allow port 80. In this case, they're allowing uh, RDP or SSH on for, um, for ngrok. So yeah, and then they rename it to sysmon just like they did with uh, Tor. So this is straight from the uh, ngrok's website. Oh, sorry, let me get rid of that VPN. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah, this is straight from the uh, Ngrox website. They're like, it's so easy to, to set up. You just unzip it. You give it auth token, which is basically the token that allows like the tunnel to be encrypted and identifies that Tor in that Ngrox instance to you to your account and run it and just go. That's pretty much how their whole documentation with to to set it up. And again, they're like to start. An, you, then you forward H HTTP, which in this case they're not going to be doing that here. But so yeah, here's like their their documentation on how to use to on Grok. The only official solution, as they put in parentheses, which I thought was interesting. Um, it's like one of the first entries in this in this set of data. Whenever I started, when I gripped it, when I created one big text file, so it was like, okay, I've seen. I actually we've actually we actually see this as well. Uh, this is. Um, them using exactly the thing, that sysmon tunnel, sysmon name binary for ngrok. And in this case, they have some options here. They have start it. Uh, I'm not, I guess I'm not familiar with the, these options as, as much as Tor, but obviously config is probably for the config for ngrok here. So that makes sense at least. So yeah, in this case, the auth token isn't in the command line like it sh we show, saw in our ngrok documentation. It's actually inside that, that YAML file. And so remote access tools, these are all the rats that they have. If anybody's familiar with 90 cartoons, that's Rat Trap. Uh, <laughs> their documentation mostly calls out any disk. But again, they I've seen a lot of malware use net support, Atera. I've seen all these ransomware groups rotate through just like I said, just they you get one blacklisted and then they'll just drop another because they have them all ready to go to switch to. So most and most legit rats, when they 
do stuff, they usually call out to their company, the, the software company's domain to, to pull down updates. Or in Net, Net Support's case, it does it to uh, get its geolocation for the, to when it's reporting to the server. Um, and then we are, Red Canary also has a pretty good blog about legit rats. This one actually I helped co-author with Justin Schoenfeld. Um, it, but basically what you're gonna look for with a Terra is like there's an email address in the command line that's kind of weird. That if you, because sometimes when you set up a Terra, it, uh, you have to give it a, an account to give in the, the setup. And he just doesn't really have an option like that, so it's a bit more difficult. Net support, it always runs out of program data, so it's our program files. So when you see these binaries doing things that they're not normally doing, that's usually a pretty big red flag for to look into. But I mean, if you see these in your network and you don't use a Terra net support or any desk, that's probably a huge red flag for you guys. So it's good to like, as they say, get a software inventory of what you actually use in your network so you understand what is normal and what is not normal for your network, because it's kind of different for everybody. A next tool they use is called Sharp Chrome. Again, this is kind of a red team tool. Uh, I don't think I've seen as many red teams use this one, but it's it basically just dumps out passwords from Chrome or cookies or any if any any useful data that uh, in Chrome. So they'll usually basically take just dump all the passwords from Chrome, and then they'll send that into another tool that they call is called Invoke SMB Auto Brute. This is going to be a tool I'll get to here in a second. Uh, so some other PowerShell tools they use, there's PowerView, uh, which mostly what they used it for in there, at least when I saw it referenced, was to using Invoke ShareFinder. This kind of helps them with enumerating the network. The network Share Invoke ShareFinder in particular helps them find shares on the network, as you would probably guess, and authenticate to them. So another tool they use is Kerber Hosting. So as we were talking about, I think, uh, some, there was a talk about that earlier, but Kerberosing is going to allow them basically to dump hashes from the network. So, um, and then invoke SMB Auto Brute. Yeah, so they have seem to rely heavily on using SMB Auto Brute because they'll basically take their list of users they want to try to brute force, and then they'll run them against this PowerShell script, and it'll kind of find some some passwords. So, and another tool they use is Power Up SQL which is basically a tool to exploit SQL servers, which as you can imagine, is probably where a company keeps all their useful data, so it's probably good for them to steal it all. Uh, so for PowerShell, this is kind of an example. This is, this is from my Google Doc, um, and it for the Invoke SMB Auto Group section, and basically they're just kind of, they're kind of step-by-step -step guiding how to use this PowerShell script. Um, to basically brute force all the users, the, the domain admins on the network. They'll basically make a list of the domain admins they want to get into, and then they'll make a list of passwords that they can use, and then they'll basically brute force them until they get an, a, a password. So, and yeah, and in, this, in this example, they scrambled two, two domain administrators, Cisco, Dur Services, and Administrator, which they had like a keyboard walk, which is kind of sad. So, <laughs> and then I also just added this slide, which I thought was interesting. I, I did a, our, our red team at my old job did a pen test where they're just like, let's just try password spraying. So let's just try a bunch of seasons and months with a year at the end and just do it. So it's, I thought it was funny that they, in their own documentation, they, they like recommend doing the exact same thing that red teams do is just try a, try a month and year and see what you get. So, and I think when we did it at my old job, we got one user <laughs> To, to successfully authenticate. Sometimes that's all they need to start getting into the network and pivoting. So, yeah, so curb roasting, they, so Rubius curb roasting this stuff, they use it basically to, to work through the network. So they'll basically, so it's a tool basically to get to interact with curb roast, which for people that aren't familiar with is like the Windows authentication protocol. So they can use this to basically steal hashes for, for users and then crack them later. They'll, they'll usually take these offline, they'll take the hashes, export them, and then crack them on their offline network in Hashcat, which is a, a password cracking tool. So uh, you should still look for Hashcat on hosts, but I don't think you'd actually see it. But what you'll see is curb roasting. So you, what, with curb roasting, you usually see a ton of network connections from a box, and it's also like, um, you'll, 
uh, like a lot of Active Directory network connections and stuff like that. And again, we have a pretty, we had a recent blog where we actually talked about Kerberosing and they, they had it with like the, the creator of Rubius, so it was pretty cool. Um, and here's from their guide on how to use Kerberos. So they're just Rubius, Kerberos, and it, and it, and they output the command, output the result into a text file right in the program data folder. Another, that was another one I kind of noticed was like, you see a lot of text files being written to program data to the root of program data. That's pretty weird because generally program data is just a bunch of folders. So you see any files in program data, that's kind of a red flag. Um, and then from, and then they t basically take that, then then the rest of this is basically them trying to run, run Rubyus to basically get hashes in different ways uh, and then brute force some passwords and stuff to authenticate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then the next tool they use is called AD Find. Uh, when I've seen Qbot like start running out of boxes, this is like one of the first things they drop. It's uh, basically a tool that lets you enumerate a network. It's a totally legit administrative tool and it basically lets them output everything. So they have like a script. This is from a defer report, that top right one is from the defer report and it basically out, it's a script to run all the AD find options to get all the users, all the computers, the OUs, everything they could possibly get from the domain and then they dump it to one file again and they look through it offline. So it's probably one of the first things, yeah, or it's, it's usually renamed. So again, like with, um, Tor and stuff, you can kind of look for like command lines that are only going to be happening from any from AD find. So like looking for AD info from something that's not AD find is probably a good place to look. So yeah, and then again, here's some more stuff from AD find in the in their documentation. Basically, it's that AD find script, AD F bat, bat script, but in text format. And so basically, it's just a, a list of commands to run with AD find to get all the data they want. Uh, yeah, and then they also kind of like show how to pivot through this data and look through things that they want to find. So like do you need to find an administrator? They look through like the user's titles and look for the director of information security or some good target for them to, 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 go, to go after. So the next, next tool they use is called Seatbelt. So I thought it was appropriate to use Ms. Frizzle. Um, it's a project to basically uh, uh, perform a number of security-oriented host safety checks, and it also does a lot of like individual host recon, so it's pretty useful from, from, a both, from both a informational perspective and an exploitive perspective. Uh, it runs tons of recon commands and like looks for different kind of misconfigurations on a host that they could use to escalate the privileges. So again, here's the command line from that one, and again, you can see they output the result straight to program data, so it's another interesting data point, like I, st I started noticing they would output everything to program data as a, te as a text file to, to exfil later to look through. The next tool they use is called NetGPP Password. So th this is actually a PowerShell script. In their documentation, they actually use it as a compiled uh, binary, but it's, it'll be the same command lines. And it basically uh, looks for passwords stored in group policy preferences. So in like an older sysadmin days, people would put the user account and password in, in certain things, and that would be stored in Active Directory sometimes. So they'll use that to their advantage and find that username and password, which is probably gonna be a, an administrator for, a net, for the network, or it'll be a valid user across the whole network, and it won't raise any suspicions if it's seen logging onto things. So, yeah, they're, it's, yeah, so it's, it's originally part of PowerSploit, but they're just using the, it by itself, so. Uh, the next tool they use is SharpView. This is basically a compiled, uh, C-sharp compiled version of uh, PowerView. So again, it, it helps them find, in this case, they're using it to find a domain user location. So they'll run it when they have their target user. They'll run it to look for what computers that admin is logging into, and they'll find, um, yeah, they'll use, I'll go back. So the next tool they use is called, is, is a tool that ex actually exploits a CVE. This is, I think, the only CVE I noticed in this set of documentation, which is another thing I thought was interesting. Um, so it exploits a CVE, the CVE is 2020-1472, and I can't tell 
exactly when this documentation was like made, but uh, like, I think from the passwords we saw at 2020. So I assume that this stuff kind of was around that same time. So this is probably a pretty useful exploit for them. Um, and it was just stayed up on their forum for a couple of years, I guess. But basically, it's a tool to exploit a command against a domain controller. It allows them to get remote privilege escalation or remote privilege remote code execution on a domain controller. So it's pretty handy for them because it probably gives them straight access to that domain controller pretty quickly. Um, yeah, and then I think CrowdStrike had a pretty good blog about the zero login vulnerability. I don't think I found anything about their tool um, specifically, but they, they it's a zero.exe, a tool of our design. I, I mean, I doubt that. I don't think they're that good, but uh, they have some command lines. They run with it. Um, the runner that gets the domain controller, give it a command to run, um, and some other stuff to basically to do whatever they want with against that domain controller. So it's a pretty handy tool, and I, I don't know how often it would work for them. I'm going to guess enough to where they had good documentation on it, so uh, patch your stuff for that at least. Yeah. So these are some sneaky, I, I'm kind of a Windows registry nerd. I did a, I think I did a a talk at B-Side Springfield a, a couple years ago where I talked about, uh, what's one of my first ones, it was about uh, Registry Explorer. So I'm always kind of a registry nerd, but these are some interesting ones that they used specifically. The, one of them is in their, a lot of their scripts, they create a user named Old Administrator and they add it to this special accounts user list. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. I like Google it. And it, the first thing that came up was like a forum post, like one of those Microsoft answer forum posts. Like, how do I, how do I, how do I prevent the, the, a user from like, appearing at the login screen? I'm like, oh, that makes sense why they use it, because they, they want to move through the network without being seen. So it's a pretty handy option. And the other thing they do is, I didn't even, I guess I didn't think about this, but uh, apparently you can change the default RDP port, which is probably good from a security perspective if you're trying to <laughs> secure something that might be, you don't want somebody remote into. But they're using it in the other sense, obviously. They're trying to hide from network traffic going in or out to blend in with something else. In their case, I think they changed it to 1350. Uh, and so here's that script. Uh, yeah, so in this case, they're running AnyDesk, and they're creating a, they're setting a password for this AnyDesk instance, and they're creating a user, they're adding it to this special list, and then they're also, in this case, this is their command to basically redirect RDP, port, RDP traffic to a new port, allow it a new fi a firewall rule for it, and, and go. So and restart terminal services to, you know, make it work. So the next, one of the other things they do I thought was kind of funny was they, so this is kind of their, their general path for privilege escalation here, is they find the admin with AD find. They use sharp view uh, to find the workstation that that admin uses, and they'll remote in using SMB shares and pass the hash to that workstation to authenticate to it at least, to log in. And then they'll start looking through that administrators workstation for password stores. Uh, they'll also look for just text files in the desktop to say password.xls or access.xls or whatever. So they're big brain thinking here, I guess. So he, in this example, they're, they're examining different directories. The ones that they looked for were like, look in the desktop, the downloads, make sure it's an admin. These are like, this looks like an admin's workstation. And if it, it is, yep. All right, so let's go to these folders. In this case, uh, again, I mentioned the app data folder before. It has, like, local has, um, usually local is, like, programs that don't have, a th like, aren't, like, installed on the computer. Sometimes you'll have stuff there. Uh, app data roaming is kind of where, like, generally programs store, like, configurations and stuff. So that's, that's again, handy for them because they might want to look for, like, FTP credentials stored in a config or something like that. Um, and then, of course, in app data local, in Chrome, they look. They go straight to the Google Chrome folder, and that's where they get again passwords that they can dump out, and they'll dump the Chrome history and uh, cookies and stuff like that. And then, of course, they'll look for LastPass, KeyPass, different folder, different stuff that related to credentials because they need to get their, they needed to get all their all the access they can get because they don't just need domain admin, they have to have privileges for the Veeam ser the server for backups like Veeam or Synology or they have to get access to any SXI servers. So that's not necessarily domain connected. So they have to find everything because they gotta, they have to wipe out that network very efficiently. So they have to find all the credentials that they can get to. Um, yeah, and then another thing they'll do is they'll they'll grab the Outlook folder. They'll go into the Outlook folder in AppData Local, 
and they'll grab the OST file so people aren't familiar with. When you open up Outlook, it like loads for a little while for the first time, but after that, it just kind of like loads immediately and you have your email. But like when you reopen your Outlook, it kind of takes a moment and then new emails start popping in at the beginning of the day. That's because the emails are actually cached on that computer when you first log in, so that so they take advantage of that, take that the, that cache set of emails, and take that for themselves and that look through that because a lot of times, I mean, how many times have any has anybody here been sent a, a password, a username and password and email, and they're told to immediately change it, but maybe they don't enforce that, whatever. So it's a good it's a good treasure trove of sensitive data, like passwords. They also of course looking for like your um, your policy, your insurance policy for cyber insurance, because they're going to charge you as much as they can. They're going to find that limit that the insurer provide that the insurer will pay out to, and then they'll just charge you exactly that much. How convenient! So, so one of the la one of the near nearly the last thing they'll do before they start encrypting things is they'll dump NTDS, which if people aren't familiar with NTDS, it's basically the entire Active Directory. Usernames, passwords, I, I, all, it's the entire domain controllers like files. So the one, the thing they'll use usually is NTDS util, and they kind of talk about running that and getting the, the NTDS dip file. But they say sometimes you get kicked out for this. So they, they're like, here's the sneakier way to do it. The thing that they do here is they'll turn on, they'll basically enable uh, volume shadows. They'll enable the Volume Shadow Service, which is basically in Windows like your backups for a file when you delete it or when you change it, you can revert that file. So like what they'll do is they'll turn it on on the domain controller and they'll take a, a Volume Shadow snapshot they'll, and then they'll copy out that, that, that NT, the NTDS dit file from that instead of running NTDS util, which will probably raise some stock red flags. Oh, so and then um, they usually exfil this file um, They'll, they'll take it, sometimes they'll just copy it straight from that box because they they usually have like a file share open to that box to remote in and pull files that they want like they were with the, um, with the, that administrator's workstation. So if you see this file, leave your network or you see this file just be zipped up and stuff's done with it. You don't know if it's taken out. If you don't know if it's been taken but you're, you think it has, you need to reset your domain controller's KR, your Kerberos ticket. KRBTGT. You can do this in the, the domain controller's um, admin panel, and you need to reset it twice or even three times, I guess, for cloud instances. But if you're, if you don't, if you only reset it once, it basically allows all the computers on the network to keep working for a little bit longer. So if you don't reset it twice, it maintains that backup. So if you, as long, if you basically have to break that connection immediately, otherwise they're gonna know something's about to happen, and they need to uh, basically re-escalate privileges, and it basically gives them a way back in uh, when you're trying to kick them out. So, so here, from their, again, this is from their documentation. This is kind of them um, creating, a, vo creating a, a volume shadow against the domain controller, or like looking for it. If it's not there, make it. Um, and then how to look through the volume shadow, how to find that volume shadow that they just created, and then um, basically the direct export that file from the from the volume shadow folder, which is kind of like this weird slash slash global root thing. You'll see it kind of at the bottom there. It's kind of a very weird syntax. You have to figure it out from like the terminal command line. And they'll do this remotely, or I've seen it happen against another network uh, local on that domain controller, they'll just, run, they'll just run volume shadows and start looking for that, NTD, that volume shadow disk drive thing, and they'll find it, and then they'll get the NTDS dip file. This is pretty sneaky, because I don't think I've seen, I didn't, I didn't never thought about this until I was looking through this data, and then like, we, I made a rule, a detection rule to find it, and it like triggered on somebody, which was kind of sad. Or, was kind of awesome too for me, but another tool they use is called FileZilla, and I'm familiar with FileZilla because it like is always loaded with adware, which is really annoying. But um, it's kind of a tool to basically remote into file shares. Um, so it's usually meant for like FTP and some other stuff. They'll use it for on their remote workstation that's usually authenticated to the network, but not 
out of the domain. And they'll basically use file, FileZilla to remote into other workstations and look through files. It kind of reminded me of when I, was, when I worked at a SOC. If I got an alert on a workstation, I'm just pulling up the run, com run prompt and just doing slash slash hostname slash slash C dollar. They're kind of doing the same thing. Again, they're just remoting in to look through the, that person's computer and look through the files. And it's very difficult to detect this. So there's not really a way to detect FileZilla to me, because like everybody uses it, but like, and it's being used remotely. So all you're seeing is like file access events. Um, next tool they use is called rclone. It's, um, it's another system administrator tool. Um, it's, it's actually, uh, I think you get this name from another tool called rsync. Um, and it basically makes it easy to copy data to make backups, was what rsync was. rclone is basically the same thing. It's just a more commercial, it's free, I think but there's a website for it and stuff. Um, again, they had a good, we have, I don't wanna talk about like the how to, exactly how to look for it because they have, there's a very lengthy blog on that one too. But basically, uh, they'll use our clone with like Mega and some other uh, file sharing utilities and you can look for like a config file, again, like, like Tor, um, and some other options that are specific to like the transfer sizes and stuff like that. So there's some good command lines there. Actually, oh yeah, there's some stuff here, yeah. Um, like in this example at the top right, chost.exe, which is our clone again in this case, they're copying a file, so you, with our clone you give it a command, a copy, a sync, uh, a backup, and some other stuff, or some other things, and then you give it some options, a path to backup, and a, and a destination with some flags. Uh, another tool they use, again, this is to decrypt Veeam passwords, so again, they'll um, for Veeam, it's a tool to basically back up virtual machines. Again, they're, they're looking for everything they can access because if they don't encrypt everything, that you may not pay the ransom. So this tool basically, they had a, a, a .NET script, yeah, a .NET script that they would compile on that, the Veeam server, and they would basically dump the entire SQL, they would use an SQL command to basically dump all the, all the information that they need for that tool and they'd compile it on the box and they'd run it and it would dump all the Veeam passwords out so that they could authenticate to it and um, encrypt things. <laughs> yeah. So next thing, they'll find, one of the last things they'll do is they'll stop all the processes. So that seems kind of weird. Why would you be like showing your hand like that? It's because they're about to encrypt everything. So if you're not familiar with like how like Windows works, if you have a program open like WinWord, you can't, you can't do anything with that Word document. You can't encrypt it. So they have to stop all the processes so that they can encrypt all those, those useful files to them. Um, so this, this list was like massive. It was like five or six, it was like, th I don't know, it was like three or four pages of like, stop this, stop this, stop this. Everything, it was just over and over again, just how to stop different services in a big giant list. So, so it like in summary, some of the things that, um, I kind of started to take away from this I was looking at it, read the manual on these things because it gives you a lot of contextual information. Um, read the manual on our clone, read the manual on um, Tor, and you start to recognize command lines when you get an alert and you're like, I don't know what this is. Like, you, it, hel it helps to like give you context when you're looking at alerts. So it's pretty, aw it's pretty, it's pretty um, awesome whenever you start, you'll start to learn things and you'll, when you just see something going across your, your Splunk data or whatever sim you're in, you might, it might start to trigger something or trigger some memories on something. So Conti is not really gone, I guess. So like, again, they disband, but they're, the tools are everywhere. These, these techniques are, they just basically rinse and repeat. I think that one of those screenshots was from, uh, like there's like a thing called like White Stork and they basically use a rename copy of Tor, just like these, just like Conti did. So they just take the same techniques and then just repeat them elsewhere. Um, like San says, no normal, find evil. So is it normal for you to use our clone? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, do you normally use Active Directory? I mean, do you use, do you use AD find in your network? Do you use net support? Uh, what, what remote access tools do you use? And that's pretty handy to know when you start seeing alerts for any desk, because you're like, it doesn't admin use any desk, I don't know. So, most of the tools here weren't zero days. 
So, I mean, it's, it's good to take care of and patch things, but don't get hung up on the latest zero day because most of this stuff is just like, just stuff off the shelf. So don't, the zero days, I personally, I don't think I've seen a lot of zero days that resulted in a lot of immediate exploitation other than like the exchange vulnerability. Most stuff, it comes out, uh, I think, what was it? The SMB one that f was from uh, the, the equation editor leaks or whatever, not equation editor, equation group, <laughs> the SMB stuff. When that came out, it was like, it was months. It was like that, that got released, then there was a CVE, then it was like patched, the patch was out in like a month. It took like three or four months for like WannaCry to start coming around and start exploiting that. So you have time to, to patch things. Don't, don't get hung up on the latest thing. That's it. Questions? Nope. Cool. Oh, yeah, sorry. Wait, where? Oh, yeah, hey. Oh, I, I don't I don't know. I was I was like, this is weird. Why are they Yeah, she's hot. I'm I'm sure, yeah. It's that Oh, is she in that? <laughs> Oh, that's that's a weird that's weird. I never put that. Well, maybe that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> Who? Come here. I gotta watch the Matrix again. It's been so long. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I got, I, I'm not a real I'm not a real hacker. Yes. Yeah. That makes that that's that's a pretty funny coincidence. That I I could see that they're just like trying to be meta with it, but also keep it low key or something like that. There was also like a lot of cool, like in the, in the documentation again, like that's why I kind of showed how to do it was like, um, there's a lot of cool stuff you could take away from this, these text files that you can, you can find in this public repo. And it was like, there was a lot of different resources for, for their pen testing. There was like guides on how to disable de Windows Defender. It's, there's a lot of cool stuff in here and it was hard to like, fit stuff into slides very easily because it was a lot of text, but it was a very easy read for me because it was just like, just you just kind of skim through it and find the stuff that's cool, so. Yep. Yeah. So 